Okay, welcome to the 74th episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today, I'm really delighted to be speaking to David Howe. David is a retired professor and dean for the School of Social Work and Psychosocial Sciences at the University of East Anglia, Norwich. He is the author of many books in the field of child abuse and neglect, especially this book here, including Attachment Theory for Social Work, Practice and Child Abuse and Neglect. Welcome, David. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, a pleasure, a pleasure. I have really loved reading your book. It is is brilliant. Um, and what, how I love to begin the podcast is just for you to share a bit of your journey. How did you get into doing work around neglect, child abuse attachment? Right, well, my background was in the natural sciences. My first degree was the natural sciences. Uh, I did a school teaching for a year or two in London. And then I switched careers and trained as a child care officer. This is back in the 1960s. So a child care officer was one of the subdivisions of social work. Um, so from about 1969, 70, I was working with children and families uh, across the whole pitch, really. Uh, and I stayed in that profession, working on the front line with families and children, many of whom had been abused and neglected before I took up this academic post at the University of East Anglia. Uh, and the rest of my career was there. Uh, now, as an academic, of course, you're obliged to research and write. So as my background was childcare, children and families, that's what I chose to research and write about, mainly, not, not exclusively. Um, so my interest began really as a result of my background we're working with children and families mm. so yes i began to research and write and the result was several books on the topic mm. 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 thank you then, and then i retired in 2010 and switched tax totally to something entirely different which we will not talk about <laughs> Unless you want to, well, w w please. W <laughs> what, what, what did no, you? No, 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 no. It's 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 very very different books on entirely different things, non-fiction on things like the Lake District and mm -hmm. Mm. rocks and science. But wow. uh, we'll leave we'll leave that to one side. I think. Mm. Yeah. How was your trip to the Lake District uh, the last couple of weeks? Was wonderful. Yeah, the weather was good. We were expecting a bit of rain, but in fact showers overnight but the daytime was fantastic so we yeah we uh had a great time um whole family joined us and we do walking i find it more difficult as i get older the young ones of course leave putting down the fells <laughs> yeah. and i trail further and further behind but that's the way it is mm, beautiful yeah our duke of edinburgh came back on saturday night from uh the lakes um, oh right yeah yeah a lovely time i said it was very warm on saturday so yeah, it was, yeah, hot. <laughs> Ooh, lovely. So uh, the second question I have is around attachment. Could you please talk a little bit about <clears throat> attachment? What is it and how important is good enough attachment for children, please, David? Right. Well, it's a big topic, as you can imagine. I mean, many books have been written about it, research over 50 years or more. Um, so it's a big, big body of literature. So trying to condense it will be quite difficult, but let me just give you an idea. Uh, human beings are very social species, we're very sociable species. Uh, we had our origins about 200,000 years ago on the plains of Northeast Africa, where we were in open savannah lands with trees, and we were essentially hunter-gatherers, uh, working in, in groups, small tribes, maybe 50 or 60 maximum. So it was a dangerous environment, there were predators, um, so there were safety numbers, and the group, of course, is the often mammals will congregate in groups for safety and protection. Uh, human infants, because we're a sociable species, we tend to have quite large brains to compute all of that social information. Um, so human infants are born with a very large brain compared to most mammals. Um, so for the first 10 to 15 years of their life, um, they are pretty dependent. And in the very early days of their life, they're very vulnerable and helpless. 
Um, so infants and toddlers on the whole aren't going to survive long on their own in that kind of environment. So evolutionists generally come up with the idea that behaviors which are adaptive, that increase survival, uh, will get built into the genetic repertoire, behavioral repertoire of the of the species. <clears throat> of the species. Um, so human infants need some kind of behaviors, indeed many mammals do, to ensure that they stay safe and close to the sources of protection, which in most cases are their primary caregivers, mothers, fathers, immediate family and kin. So essentially, whenever the child feels distressed, upset, bothered, um, they'll emit what are called attachment behaviours. And for very young children, of course, they don't have locomotion, they can't walk, so they'll cry, um, they will emit distress signals. Mo most mammals will do that. You go out onto the fells on a summer's day and you hear lambs bleating when they've got too far from the flock. Um, so human instincts are, are very similar to that. So when they're in a distressed, aroused state, because the environment feels dangerous, they feel vulnerable, they feel that possibly there are risks around, they will emit these attachment behaviours, the goal of which is to reunite them with the source of safety, which is usually the group or the primary caregivers. Mm -hmm. And of course, by emitting distress signals, attachment behaviors, then a sensitive caregiver will immediately respond and do something about the distress. It could be you fall over and hurt your knee. It could be that big dogs bounded towards you and you've never seen a big dog before. These are frightening things. So the parent will comfort the child. And the parent will do this through all sorts of sensory mechanisms. They will cuddle the child, they will talk to the child, explain what's going on, they'll reassure the child that they're now safe. So at that point, the parent is regulating the child's distress and emotion. So once the child's regulated emotionally, then they're back to the normal state. And when the child is regulated, calm, feels safe, not vulnerable, then of course they can do all the important developmental things that children need to do play, explore, be curious, investigate. So there's a balance all the time between attach attachment behavior from the child, mm -hmm. uh, being regulated by the caregiver, and then doing what children do, finding out about the world and how it works. Now, in order to do this, the caregiver, the, 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 the parent, usually in most cases, will generally connect with the child's mind trying to see the thing from the child's point of view. So the child is being understood from what's called a mental state perspective, mm -hmm. uh, making sense of the child psychologically. So this is an important bit of traffic that takes place between caregivers and children. Um, so that's the general background to attachment behavior. Uh, now in the course of this, of course, some parents are more or less sensitive. Some parents aren't very good at this. Uh, some children lose their parents. So to be on your own and apart from the source of safety is a very frightened place to be. So to discover that you're in a situation that feels exposed, that you feel vulnerable, then of course at that point your arousal system is going to be heightened. If there's nobody there to deal with it, to regulate it, then of course you stay, you stay in a highly stressed, dysregulated state. And that's quite frightening. So that's the kind of rough background. I'm sure I've missed out many bits, but roughly that's the general basic thesis. So the mechanism there is that the regulation of the child's distress helps the child begin to understand themselves, not just as a physical being, but as an emotional, mental, psychological being. And most parents, when they're what's called affect regulating, in other words, responding to the child's emotions, are giving the child information about the child's emotional state. Um, oh, you're upset. You've just seen that big dog. I know you're frightened, but it's okay. He's quite friendly. Um, look, look, turn the child around. Look, there he is. He's, he's looking at you. He wants to give you a lick. That's okay. But it was frightening, wasn't it? Now, as those conversations take place, the child is beginning to learn that, yes, I was frightened. This thing that was happening to me physically mm -hmm. was fear. But I'm feeling safe now because mum or dad or whoever has is, is, is now got me cuddled and safe and warm. Um, but that explains to me what happened, why I felt like I felt, why I, why I felt what I did in my head, what I thought was happening. 
So you're getting all these explanations about what was happening to me. And of course, because the brain is in a very major stage of development from birth during the first few years, mm. it's helping the brain begin to make sense of itself. I, I used to have this phrase, I think it crops up somewhere in that book you showed, mm. that in order to make sense of experience, the brain needs to be exposed to experience of which it needs to make sense, <laughs> which sounds a bit circular. But the brain has to be exposed to experiences in order for the brain to wire itself up to make sense of those experiences. And one of the key experiences to make sense of is other people's minds, your mind, and how things happen between minds. Uh, and Peter Fonge calls this mentalization, learning about how to think and feel, to think about feelings and feel about thinking, and such a key component. And you need an attuned, empathic, sensitive caregiver at times of dysregulation for that traffic, psychological traffic between parent and child to begin to take place in order that child begins to be able to process these complex social, emotional situations. Whew. <laughs> I, think, I think I've done it. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, that was very clear. Thank you. And I know I could go off on tangents here, but I'd like to then move into neglect. Okay. And just, you know, could you speak a bit to it? You know, what is yeah. it? And I think you, you also mentioned when we were speaking earlier um, that, that neglect in some senses is more profound than abuse. Obviously, abuse is extremely serious and you could be killed in abuse, let's face it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a different kind of um, child maltreatment. But neglect is manifold. You can be neglected physically. You mm. can be neglected in terms of whether you're fed or not. You can be neglected in terms of your medical needs. You can be neglected educationally. But also you can be neglected in terms of the parent having you in their mind when they're dealing with your needs and wants and fears and vulnerabilities. So neglect is the absence of a connection, a psychological connection between the parent's mind and the child's mind. And if the parent isn't physically present, of course, then there is no connection whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, but neglect in a general routine sense is when the parent, for whatever reasons, they could be a drug addict, they could have their own problems and traumas, um, they could be... Um, perhaps have major marital difficulties, they haven't got the emotional, psychological energy to constantly engage with and connect psychologically and emotionally with their child. The child feels abandoned. And if you feel abandoned emotionally, psychologically, physically, nutritionally, mm -hmm. um, then, of course, it will activate your attachment behaviour. But you can't take your attachment behavior anywhere because no one's interested in you. No one's there for you. So the attachment gets activated, but it doesn't get regulated because the parent isn't doesn't have you in mind, uh, isn't dealing with whatever is causing you the distress. So you're left on your own with being in a dysregulated, stressed state. So you've got to develop mechanisms to try and deal with that arousal that can't be handled by the environment, which is why rejection, neglect, abandonment tend to be quite profound in terms of human development, because basically the child can't do these things on their own. They need to connect with minds. In order to understand their own mind, they've got to be understood by other minds. And that, that understanding other mind needs to feed back to you um, your own mental states. But if that's not happening, then all of this is going on in your head, mm -hmm. but you can't process it. You can't begin to, as it were, make sense of what's happening to you. You're neglected. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, a lot to pray. <laughs> yeah. It's a huge topic. It's a huge topic. So mm -hmm. I'm slightly. Yeah. And I, I love it because what you're saying obviously as we shared when we spoke a, a month or so ago about my area of interest is around mm -hmm. borders and as you speak there i'm hearing that lens of right yeah the parents aren't there so i would love to segue a little bit into 
you know, what obviously in the the West we have this uh, idea of boarding schools, certainly in the UK, that it's a, g- a good thing. I was on GB News at the weekend. There was a professor mm-hmm. saying, you know, it's great. And I was saying, well, actually, I don't believe it is. And I have the, res- the research there. So I'd love to hear your perspective of, you know, having studied neglect, child abuse, and then what do you feel about the system we have in the UK at the moment? About boys? Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> where to start? Uh, I didn't go to public or boarding school myself. I went to a state school, so I was went home for my tea and dinner every evening quite happily i'm sorry it's very hard to imagine what it must be like not to have that there mm-hmm. depends what age of course you start going to boarding school that will partly determine it depends to some extent on what experiences you had prior to going to boarding school so again let me just just wander a little bit over the topic because you could take it in different strands let's assume for argument's sake that you had a very happy secure mm-hmm. first six or seven years of life um, all the things that I was talking about earlier were happening. Mm. Loving parents who you felt secure with. In other words, all your play, exploratory, curious, curiosity behavior was intact. No one was leaving you or abandoning you. So that was fine. Um, so you go with a degree of resilience when you start an environment. And suddenly, you know, all the things that were there are not there anymore. You're in a strange place with lots of new people, many of them whom may or may not be kind to you or interested in you. Um, there may be rules, there may be structures that you're not a, not familiar with. And so all of that is new information. You're going to be stressed. Let's face it, we're all, we all get stressed in new environments, whether it's a new job, a new place, or going to a new part of the world. And of course, age six, seven or eight, going to a, a complex institutional environment is, I would guess, quite challenging um, for everybody. Um, so if you've had a fairly good first six or seven years, okay, that's going to be a challenge. Um, you have the resilience. You may have the mental capacity, the emotional, psychological skills to be able to work out some of the dynamics of what's going on in the setting, who's who, who's a bully, who's not a bully, what the rules are, who to stay safe with, what you can and can't say, whether you should be vulnerable or not vulnerable, dare you cry, dare you show weakness, all of these things you begin to process because you've been able to do that in the past. Still not easy because you can't take that anxiety and stress anywhere because there's no one to take it to. So it's going to be a challenge. Um, There may be friends or people in the school that you can act as kind of substitute attachment figures but peers at that age can't really do it you may get best friends and there you can have conversations but you've got to learn to trust people um that's perhaps the most benign scenario i can think of um so you you, you may get through it okay uh if you're free to contact your home, your parents, your caregivers, fine. If you allowed mobile phones to make contact, if you can telephone, um, letter writing, there is some kind of long distance maintenance of some kind of secure base. Because care, caregivers historically are seen as a safe haven and a secure base at times of need. Okay, it's now to distance, um, but it, you know it's there. And it's tough. And if someone understands it's tough, then at least you can have those conversations. If you've not had perhaps such a secure beginning, then the defences that you established prior to going to school will get reactivated in that environment. Um, There are all sorts of different pathways through that. Some children who perhaps not had the ideal early start in life may develop what's called um compulsive compliance they generally obey the rules don't rock the boat because they know if they start making demands on other people it'll backfire 
So they they play safe, they play low, they they follow the rules, they don't rock the boat. Um, some become compulsively self reliant. Uh-huh. By that, don't show anxiety, don't show attachment, don't show vulnerability, don't show need, don't show weakness, because it gets you nowhere. Um, and if in this new environment all of these things are particularly heightened, then clamp them down, be self-contained. In fact, weakness is to be despised. Mm-hmm. Weak people go under. Don't be weak. Mm-hmm. Be strong. Don't show weakness. It doesn't mean that the dysregulation has gone away, but it's internalized. Mm-hmm. And it begins to have its own psychological developmental consequences. So one strategy that many children use in difficult environments without an available, responsive, secure base, safe haven caregiver is to batten down the emotional leakage, as it were, and just keep it all to yourself. And in fact, if other people show weakness, because it arouses in you those feelings of, ah, what could be me? You begin to be rather dismissive of it even aggressive towards it, which may make you a bully. I don't know. Um, those things can happen. So com- compulsive self-reliance is very typical. And you will often claim, doesn't bother me. I can cope with these things. I'm strong. Um, you know, I'm the sort of person who really doesn't get affected by emotions. Uh, they can bang on without any upset. Uh, nothing bothers me. So that attitude of... Uh, setting about life and belittling and dismissing other people's vulnerabilities and weakness then can take you quite a long way in life. Many pathways through life actually might value those qualities, mm-hmm. sadly. Um, so that, that could be another way forward. Um, the other is just, just to get into some kind of distressed psychological, almost post-traumatic stress disordered state. Mm-hmm. Where really you're you're in a bit of a psychological mess. You you know you will get distressed and upset, but no one is going to respond to it. Uh, possibly tell you pull yourself together, uh, make yourself a man or a woman, depending on what environment you're in. Um, all of these things could happen. I'm trying to think, think of my feet here. I'm not quite mm-hmm. sure. I'm taking it in directions that uh, that's I, brilliant. It's brilliant. Please keep keep going. So what I'm suggesting is that depending on your early experiences, and to some extent your innate temperament, because we're all temperamentally different and also have genetic propensities that make us more or less able to deal with different environments, that combination of early nature and nurture, genetic and environmental experiences, then you bring to this new situation, which makes you more or less resilient or vulnerable. Uh, the more challenging the situation, um, then the more it taxes your resilience. Mm-hmm. Uh, and most of us, under very difficult circumstances, would find our resilience has a limit. Mm-hmm. Let me just quote you a very f- set of famous experiments. I don't, I'm not sure you can translate this into a boarding school, but just bear with me while I think about it. Um, there's a famous, rather dodgy ethical experiment in which Dogs were wild street dogs, dogs that had got no owners but just wandering the streets were brought into a laboratory and they were put in a cage Uh, and they got electric shocks in this cage. Um, But before they got an electric shock, they were given some kind of reward. And when they got the reward, the shock would happen. They didn't like the shock, they reacted adversely to the shock, but they knew when it was coming they could anticipate it because something happened and then the shock followed. Um, so there's a kind of behavioral order. Event, treat happens, shock takes place. Now those dogs sort of coped okay with that because they could, the environment was predictable. You knew what was coming. But some dogs were suge- subjected to no treats, just random shocks that had come at any time, anywhere, any place. So the dogs, the dogs had to remain on alert all the time. They could never relax. So when you know in a predictable environment what's happening, in between times, you can be quite relaxed. But if an environment is unpredictable, you never know when the next assault 
verbal, emotional, physical that's going to come, you can never switch off. You're in stress mode all the time. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, has all sorts of dire consequences. Um, and the dogs who are subjected to random, unpredictable shocks, basically, psychologically, if, if you're a dog, collapse. They just became nervous wrecked, literally, in many cases. So you need some degree of predictability and control over your environment so that you can at least then mitigate some of the more difficult challenges that come your way. So again, without predictability, mm. you're on your own. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. As you're speaking, I can just resonate with my own experience of boarding school. So I went to age mm. 11 through to age right. 18. Yeah. And I was asked on GB News, actually, on Saturdays, said, um, you know, I asked to go to boarding school. And Philip Davis, the, the MP, was asking me, well, did you, I chose as well. And he says his first year was horrible. He really hated the first year. But then he said after that, he, he enjoyed it. And for me, it was the first three weeks I enjoyed it. And then suddenly I realized mm -hmm. what that meant to be away from family meant I was away from everything, not just mm. uh, my mum, but my dad, my sister, my home, food, safety. You know, until I was 16, I never had a door of privacy apart from on the toilets downstairs. So there was uh, bar open baths, open toilets upstairs, um, open cubicles. Uh, and so I, when you're saying that, I was in fear. Mm. Even mm. though I was 18, even though I was uh, good at sports, I was in fear all the time. And I was researching, and I think it's, I kind of wrote it down here. Um, I think it's Bear Grylls. He's just saying, when I hit boarding school, he was eight, suddenly all I felt was fear. Fear forces you to look tough on the outside. But yeah. Weak on the inside. Yeah. And so I can yeah. really resonate. Yeah, yeah. And of course, it's this, I think the one, the major defence in these situations, as I said before, you've just echoed really with yourself and Bear Grylls, is that don't appear weak. Mm -hmm. Weakness is despised. Um, toughen up. Um, yeah. And as we said before, it's it, they are attributes that can take you a long way in life in certain, I'm not sure getting bear grills is, but I mean, is it any accident that he's become the kind of guy who takes himself off into the wilderness and copes on his own and becomes self-reliant to a degree most would never imagine? Was 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 that the bonus he got out of his experiences of boarding school? Yeah, maybe, because it sounds like he was securely attached at the beginning. And there's a beautiful paper, and I'll send it to you later, if you want, is um, Anne Powers, psychotherapist, wrote oh, yeah. about attachment and boarding school. She's saying oh, right. what, what right. she felt was secure, securely attached people were likely to show emotions, but they were more likely then to be bullied. And there would also be that conflict because if they love me, my my parents, why do they send me away? Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. it's yeah. really confusing. It's like, but suddenly to lose, you know, all of that um so yeah yeah um so i guess then i'd love to segue a bit uh, this is fascinating i i could go off on a thousand tangents here but I'll, I'll stay to some of the questions if we've been neglected as a child how might the sim what might the symptoms be as an adult please david um gosh uh uh, there, there are various kinds of neglect. So the most extreme version are children who are dumped in orphanages where there's very poor facilities. I think the ones I quote in the book are when the dictator Ceausescu um, was overthrown in Romania, the country discovered lots of these orphanages with kids that had been there since almost birth. Very poor conditions, very few carers, no, no fault of the carers. They just couldn't cope with hundreds of kids who were basically just left in cots for years on end, no interaction. And of course, the the developmental delays of these children were huge. Now, when they were placed in foster homes or even adopted, um, 
usually with parents who are very loving and caring, there was developmental catch-up, but there was a legacy of psychological damage, if you like. Um, there was vulnerabilities, there were weaknesses throughout the lifespan. And these were very fragile people. That's the most extreme kind of neglect, as you can imagine. Um, there's neglect in families that are subject to poverty, where parents might be drug or alcohol alcoholics. <clears throat> um, there may be many children in these rather just basically fragmented, chaotic families. So basically, these are children who develop various strategies in conditions of neglect. Some may decide that, okay, um, if no one's going to look after me, I'm going to look after myself. I'll feed myself when I want. I'll go and graze in the kitchen, pinch what I can. Maybe go and look in the bins to see what's going on in the bins, see who has been thrown away. Um, I'm going to belittle my parents. These are called coercive children. They start to be mm -hmm. kind of cocky and aggressive um, because that's the only way to survive, really. You, know, you make demands on the environment to make sure it deals with you. You're not learning much about yourself. You're just learning that to get by, you've got to be aggressively tough and self-reliant. Some children try to get around this by being, if you like, particularly vulnerable and weak, exaggerating their dependency, and their neediness, whiny, demanding, poor me, uh, almost exaggerating to a degree that forces people to acknowledge the fact you're, you're in a state of need, whatever that need might be. So they kind of overdo it. Um, they become emotionally vulnerable. They play the victim card all the time. It's uh, it's always tough on them. No one understands them. No one recognizes them. So they tend to exaggerate that. The, the more general strategy is probably to go a combination of the two, where neglect can lead to, in some cases, the sense of being reliant on the self, but also when it all gets too much, collapsing into a kind of emotional, if not chaos, then certain state of neediness and exaggerated dependency. So people can oscillate between the two. Um, they can be determined that nothing is going to get them down. Um, sod the rest of you, you know, <laughs> despise the vulnerable. You know, I laugh at the weak. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not, I won't go into too many political areas here, but you can imagine where I might take this argument in terms of many politicians who have lack of empathy when it comes to people who perhaps aren't coping too well with life. Um, so that, that's another strategy. Or you could just deal with it by by trying to deaden it all. You know, it's all just too much. You don't, you can't understand relationships. You get into them, but because no one's been connecting with your mind to you, to help you make sense of your, your, the way you think and feel, you can't make sense of other people, they just behave, but you don't understand why they behave because no one's helped you understand behavior in yourself and other people. Relationships are desired, but when you get into them, it's difficult, it's stressful. Making sense of yourself and them, what they do and what they say and how they behave and how they feel, it means that generally the whole business of being in social relationships is quite stressful because you've never been helped to make sense of them you're not the sort of developmental being who can understand the complexity of social life so you desire proximity and closeness and intimacy but when you get it it goes wrong because you're not very good at it um you can get aggressive because you're not making sense of it you can withdraw you can take to drink or drugs to try and deaden the confusion and the hurt and the chaos. And probably for many neglected children who haven't been helped along the way, then that route is probably the most common. That sense of wanting to be involved, to be intimate, to be close, and yet somehow not being able to do it. Mm -hmm. It's all too much. And if you have kids yourself, of course, kids are the ultimate stressor. <laughs> any of us who are parents will know that you know, young children are very demanding but if you've never been helped to understand your own response to stressful situations then you can't deal with it so you'll deal with it aggressively 
or neglect or opt out or drink or drugs or abandonment even mm -hmm. um so there are different pathways the only, the only thing i'll add to that is there's there's a nice category by a woman called mary main who sadly died fairly recently she's a major american developmental psychological researcher who was a pioneer in many of these ideas and attachment she has this other category category called earned secure if along the way if you've been neglected or abused for that matter or had a tough start in life you get into relationship with someone who gives you time who can be empathic who can begin to say okay oh i can see that you've had a tough day what's happened someone's beginning to connect with you someone's beginning to listen to you to, to help you make sense not just of them but the fact that you understand them uh, and that they can then begin to understand you you're helping them develop basically the mentalization that peter fonagy talks about so eloquently the idea that we are mental state beings the world is a world of people people behave but to understand behavior, you've got to understand their mental states. Why is she laughing? Why is he crying? Why is he being rude? We ask these questions all the time, every day. It's gossip, it's, it's the stuff of conversation. It's We see behavior and we want to know the reason why. And most of us get that in our early years. Parents help you make sense of those kind of things. Um, She's laughing because she's just read a funny joke in the newspaper. That's why she's laughing. So there's an explanation for behavior. But if you've been neglected, people behave, but you don't know why they behave. Ditto when you become a parent of children. They do things that annoy you, upset you, stress you. You don't know why. So you deal with it aggressively, defensively, opting out, benumbing yourself with drugs and alcohol. So that's probably the most common route for severe neglect. Um, but the earn secure that Mary Main talked about was that if you get into a relationship with someone who can do this mentalization with you, it sounds very grand, but in practice, it's just someone who's interested in you, mm -hmm. heaven's sake, um, who understands that you know, it's been a tough day or it's been a tough experience. And if you've got into a good foster home, there's a school caretaker who suddenly realizes that you're a poor lost soul mm -hmm. or an auntie who feels sorry for you and starts to take an interest in you. Uh, I don't know, a netball coach, if you know, you're a girl who's into netball, somebody who recognises, actually, I know why you come to netball. It's a safe place for you. And maybe I'll take an extra interest in you. If you start to get a little bit of experience of how it should be, then you can develop what's called earned security. And these people tend to do okay in life. But you need that someone and where you find that someone often is quite accidental or arbitrary but many children do they almost home in on where to find that relationship but many many don't yeah and i think you say in the book that sometimes people who have been neglected some children overdo it they're not aware of who to trust or not and they're going to sit on everyone's laps exactly yes yeah, yeah. Is, certainly in a lot of boarding schools you go to those people who are giving you attention but they turn out to be pedophiles because yeah they, yeah yeah, you know, yeah because they're not aware they haven't learned from parents okay be a bit aware of that yeah or that one but thank you that's brilliant and the last five minutes i could say you talk about the common root of neglect for me you're just talking boarding school syndrome as soon as you say all really, of this, really oh, you know I've been working one-to-one -one with people for eight yeah. years you're just saying that is that is gosh. so common for us we get triggered very easily especially with our children yeah these types of things addictions um really keeping intimacy at arm's length yeah so you yeah say this it's like right and i found that reading your book so many aspects of it just this morning reading the aspect of um why is it that parents neglect their children or even i'm using it through the lens of teachers because mm. often the teachers in these institutions have been to the same institutions therefore they're already right. running that same attachment system avoidant or insecure yeah. And therefore, you know, and I'll read you something because this is quite shocking. Um, 
if I can find it. Now, this is a diary which was uh, dictated to us by my housemaster when I was 11, 12. And there was one boy on the year below me, and he was doing the second form of neglect, the poor me, overdoing it, a lot of emotions, tears, screaming. If you touch him, you're like, ah, oh! You yeah, know? yeah. And the school just was kind of giving him more and more of it, kicking him in the dining hall so he would scream out. Um, and this is 10th of November. So we've been at school for two months at this point. And this is the housemaster. He says, first 15, beat Eastbourne. And I won't say his name, but such and such was observed to smile. This is after two months. He's made a note to us as the dormitory that it was the first time in two months that he smiled. And that just breaks my heart. Totally, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's rather shocking. So I guess where to go from here? There's so many areas I could um, go to. I think one of the things I have been fascinated by recently is as I've been reading your book is reading biographies yeah. of David Cameron, of John Peel, Stephen Fry. And one of the things in your book, you talk about uh, physical neglect and your words were the broad characteristics of physical neglect are familiar to most childcare practitioners. Nutrition can be poor. Clothes are old or dirty or too big. Bedrooms are sparsely furnished and cold. Children are left unsupervised and understimulated. And then these are the words of David Cameron. The food was Spartan. I lost a stone in weight during a single term. He was seven or eight years old. So I, to right. get people into contact, the average age of a seven or eight year old is three stone eight or four stone. So he's lost a quarter of his body weight. There was one meal that consisted of curry, rice and maggots. In other, in the school grounds were woods and a lake where we could play unsupervised in green boiler suits. There's something of a miracle that no one drowned. So I'd love you to speak mm. a bit about physical neglect, what you've seen in your your work, but also relating that into the story from David Cameron. Gosh, right, right. That's a quote and a half, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, where's the start with that? I mean, food is so basic that, you know, if, if you are hungry, then, you know, we'll, we'll do anything to try and feed that appetite. Um, it's such, such a basic need that it will drive our behaviour, overriding most other things. You do what you can to try and satiate your 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 hunger. I don't know what David Cameron did, but... <laughs> uh, so that, that kind of physical neglect... Um, presumably means that I'm, I'm trying to think if, if you're in a non state school and you're coming from a background of neglect, then at school you're going to be the kid who's hungry, smelly, dirty, and you'll be teased, you'll be bullied, you'll be humiliated. But if you're all in the same boat, um, that you're all hungry, um, that you're all basically left abandoned. I, I'm trying to think what the developmental pathway through that would be. Um, do you band together? Does it cement relationships, or does it uh, does it make you out for number one and nobody else? Uh, I, I would need to reflect on that. Um, yeah, I think you know, as Nick Duffel says, the, the psychotherapist who's been researching this for about thirty thirty odd years. Yeah, you know, he says we all have to survive. So I think we do have different ways of surviving mine was to keep my head down not speak yeah. suppress all my emotions yeah you know, the food thing we had a table of 14 of us the older boys would get the food at the beginning and they would pass the food down by the time it got to our end there was no food a lot of my clients say they're hungry first year or two um how we dealt with it we would go around the the the, the kind of uh, the dining room begging to see if we could get more food you know what i did is i often would supplement my food with tuck so i became very inward like mm -hmm. very miserly 
um, other children, you know, would steal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, to 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 get that, I think some people say it's a, a bonding together. But for me, I, I I got a sense in my school, and I've heard this a lot in others. It's it's all about me. I have to survive here. I will do whatever. I yeah. Can. And so, so again, it it does encourage that uh, the weak go under under the strong survive. They steal. They become top dog. They try to get to the head of the table. They 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 pinch from other people. Um, so it would bring out qualities that, on the whole, are not very attractive, um, generally. But as I keep saying, in some walks of life, that attitude of get it only only suckers basically go under. Um, there are lots of losers out there. I mean, even the phrase "loser" is a terrible phrase, uh, and yet that's how many people who've learned to say. Don't be weak, be strong, see other people who tend to be more vulnerable, more open, um, you know, less robust. They're the losers. Uh, and they're to be there to be despised. And let's not let's not give them any time at all. Certainly don't give them any help or support. So you can produce those kind of extreme behaviors where I'm successful, you're not. I'm a winner, you're a loser. Um but on the other hand, some people may just just feel that life is fragile, and maybe relationships are difficult to trust. But when you do find one, hang on to it. Is what I would say. Mm. Could be a partner, be a friend. Um, but learn, learning to trust someone is so so difficult if you've never been confident in trusting other people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I bless my wife. Uh... You know, I was obviously insecurely attached. I had a breakdown in my 20s and met my wife in my early 30s. I'm now nearly 50 and she's been amazing, securely helping me to, like you said, regulate feedback and it's been so healing. So, well, Mary Mayne would be really pleased to hear your story then, Piers. Earn security. Yeah, it's yeah. Never, it's never too late. Relationships are where things go wrong, mm-hmm. but it's where they go right. And really, yeah, I suppose the, the underlying psychotherapeutic or general message is that a good relationship is where most of us can heal and grow and learn how to be a decent human being. Mm-hmm. But the more, I suppose, the more insecure, the more hurt, the more damaged you've been, the more difficult it is to trust relationships and when you're in those relationships to deal with them fairly competently. You need the other person to be willing to stay with you as you struggle to find your own mind, as it were, in these difficult situations. But, you know, many people do, as indeed it sounds as if you have as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So don't give up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, it's interesting how almost the solution is to find someone to help regulate our emotions and almost it's interesting that that was what caused the problem in the first place, but makes sense that that's the solution is for us to find that other person, whether it's friends or um, yeah. partner. To I mean, I, mean I, I keep mentioning Peter Fonagy's work, but he has this concept of, as I said before, of mentalization. A lot of the work that they do is looking at how people in difficult situations, just either internally or generally in life benefit from being in relationships where people are are noticing the fact you know i see that you're i don't know this is not you now but you know it is a kind of a, an example um someone might say you're looking very stressed what's the matter mm-hmm. you're recognizing that body language gives information you're also acknowledging there might be an emotional state behind it but you're also noting that there may be a cognitive state behind it because you're thinking something that's affecting your emotions, which is affecting your body language. It, it sounds slightly elaborate like that, but it's what we do all the time. And people who are very empathic and attuned are very good at this. They will, they will connect. And as they connect, they're giving information back about not only can I understand you, but 
I can help you understand me understanding you because I can talk about all the things that are happening to you. And some people are just very good at that. Uh, and when we meet them, we tend to think, yeah, okay, I like you. Um, <laughs> yeah, I may not be the most pleasant human being, but I, you're the first person who's listened to me or you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and these, these, these people do exist either just in life or you, I suppose you could do it through a very good psychotherapist. But most of us, you know, do come across people like that in life. People who just generally, you know, are good at getting other people. And other people like to be understood. We all like to be understood. Yeah. And these people are very good at understanding other people. And as you're understood by other people, you begin to understand yourself. Empathy begets empathy. Yeah. There's a whole book somewhere I've written on that. Where's it gone? I've lost it. <laughs> have to read it. I really enjoyed reading your book on neglect. It's, you know, I do you recommend? There's another one on, on empathy. Is that the right way around, or is it mirror? Yeah, no, that's right. Empathy. Yeah, it's great. By David Howe, another book. <laughs> so, thank you. If we could maybe segue a bit into empathy, then, if we've had a neglectful, I mean. If we've had a neglectful childhood and maybe we've learned, you know, we've talked a little bit about leaders, you know, mm -hmm. if you've been through this environment, I think Liz Truss's government, there were 75% had been to boarding schools. Uh, <laughs> Are they really? <laughs> Boris Johnson's government. Liz Truss hadn't been, but Quasi Kwarteng, a lot of um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rishi Sunak, people like that. Um, and then obviously Rishi Sunak. He's been to boarding school, I think 63% of all high court judges boarding school. So if we've learned to suppress our empathy, or as you said, you know, um, well, it's not suppress it. It's, it's not suppress it. You haven't, you know, they haven't got much of it in the first place. So there's not much to suppress. Okay. <laughs> right, right. So what do we do then in order to develop empathy if we don't have much of it in the first place? Well, the only way to get empathic is basically, as you said yourself, to be in a relationship where the other person is being empathic. Mm -hmm. Because to be understood is to be halfway there. And someone who is interested in you, your characteristics, and why you do what you do, may even comment, you know, you know, well, why are you doing this again? You know, you know it gets you nowhere. Uh, every time you've got that look on your face, and you might you might say this with a smile on your face because you don't want to be aggressive in it, you say, "There must be something going on there. Tell me about it. What's happening? You know, you're looking so so wild about this." Um, and then it might initiate a conversation. Don't get aggressive with me. <laughs> I'm interested in what's happening. You know, it's, it's, I can see it's not not comfortable for you. So you you tend to get in that kind of dialogue. So empathic people tend to be rather good at, as it were, allowing the other people to feel safe in a relationship. Now, we tend not to begin to open our own thought processes and feeling processes until we feel safe in a relationship. If the other person feels safe, a secure haven, uh, a, a secure base, a safe haven, then we might just dare ourselves to say a little bit about we feel vulnerable or we may say a little bit you're not going to do it in one bound it's going to take many many engagements with the other person but if you begin to feel this is a safe haven and a secure base in which maybe you might just begin to let yourself think about yourself because you're not even doing that you're not allowing yourself to feel vulnerable because to feel vulnerable is to be weak and to be weak is to be a loser. Um, don't be weak. Um, but if you're in a relationship where it is safe to admit that maybe uh, this is hard or that you've got it wrong or that you're hurt or you're cross or you don't know or you, whatever the weakness of vulnerability or psychological need might be, then gradually to share this over time will help you begin to process your own behaviours, thoughts and feelings and to give you a, a more coherent psychological sense of self. It's that lack of coherence that means that people tend to go down one particular route. 
and again going back to possibly some politicians um those attributes have probably got them to the top of the chain to be a politician they really, you know the top table as it were but you know when it comes to supporting the poor the weak the dependent the disabled people in boats whatever it might be not interested that's weak they're losers and really i don't want much to I may know politically I've got to say something that sounds a bit more understanding, but really I'm not going to do much about it. And of course, we know that happens all the time. You've only got to listen to the rhetoric that we hear about, you know, I bet I'll get too political here, but, you know, is the welfare state a good thing? Probably not. No, it just simply supports those who don't deserve it. That nice Victorian phrase, the undeserving poor, you know, it's not gone away, really, has it? Mm. So empathy begets empathy. Uh, but if you're not sure about your trust in other people, it may take time, even if you found someone who actually you feel, OK, I think this is a safe place, a safe relationship. Maybe I can begin to think and feel about me to make sense of me and how I think, feel, and behave. And it may be frightening to do that at times, but I know I'm being understood. And to be understood is to be halfway there. Mm, thank you. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, I kind of I spent time in my 20s in a part of my recovery was a monastery, Buddhist monastery, mm. a lot of compassion and empathy. And I did find that, that... I had the monks there who were so empathetic. Yeah, like, yeah. An idiot, you know, <laughs> self-harming and, you know, things. Yeah. Like they were so, had so much empathy and that helped it. Yeah. Develop in myself. But yeah. They're loving me unconditionally. Even when yeah. I it. So, yeah, it definitely can resonate with that. So, thank you. But you've got to let yourself be vulnerable in that relationship before you begin to, as it were, heal yourself in all these different elements. And if you carry on in life, basically just never being weak and vulnerable, then of course you don't change. You remain compulsively self-reliant uh, and dismissive of vulnerability, need, weakness in other people. And you can career through life, get very rich and successful on that formula. Many people do. Um, yeah. <laughs> I could name lots of the world's dictators who probably had backgrounds that are not a million miles away from the conversation we're having. Well, it's interesting that even Stalin, he was boarding school. Once you actually scratch mm. under the surface, Elon Musk boarding school, Donald Trump, uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, Richard Branson. There's so many people who are in charge, have a lot of power. Mm. the boarding school i think elon musk he was thrown down the stairs at his prep school and hospitalized you know and of course they they now in positions of power set the agenda yeah exactly uh, i've only got to read some newspapers to see that weakness is a is basically for losers mm. <laughs> yeah and then you look at ah oh, you know rupert murdoch he was boarding school you know the head the daily mail the owner of that lord rothermere again lord rothermere yeah the Barclay Brothers, the Telegraph. Yeah, yeah. And, and so what's the solution then, David? What can we do? <laughs> what can we do, especially if we, on a on a micro level, I'm hearing, obviously, you've mentioned about relationships. What else can we do if we've had neglect? What, what helped your clients or people who you were working with since the 60s? Well, of course, I, I am working on the, the micro level, as you put it, with people on an individual basis. And you would, ideally, if it was a child, you might in extremis have to have them fostered or even adopted if it was that bad. Um, but ideally, you'd like them to stay with the family. So you wouldn't necessarily work directly with the child. You'd work with the parent's relationship with the child. So by being that understanding, empathic person with the parent, so the parent begins to feel more relaxed, less stressed, it means they're more available for the child who's been neglected. 
Now that's a long-term strategy. There's no shortcuts to that. Mm-hmm. Again, the, again, we're on to a kind of political front here, but things like Sure Start um, for young children, where parents could go and be with other parents, the stress gets diluted. The child is playing. They can see other people, particularly some of these Sure Start staff, how they engage with the child. They're seeing behaviour. Oh, okay. I see my little girl's responded to that. You know, I may not be able to mimic it tomorrow, but I'm seeing behaviours that seem to be more functional. So group work like Sure Start and play groups where mothers are engaged and involved. Again, I would generally recommend lots of that, but of course that's all been stripped away. So again, we're we're reduced to what you can do on a much more restricted basis. Um, and with the resources available, the, the, the honest answer is not a lot these days. People just don't have time. Social workers don't have the time anymore. Massive caseloads. Um, health visitors have hundreds of people. They used to be very good for young mothers who came from difficult backgrounds. You know, They would give them time. They would teach them how to interact with their child. So there were many professionals who would actually be involved on that kind of day-to-day basis. They've gone. They should come back. There are budgetary implications there, tax implications if you want big budgets. So I think on the grand level, it's a political argument. Uh, And the political argument is, do you feel that the state should put resources into this? Because in the long term, it will pay dividends. In the short term, it doesn't appeal. There's some there, you might have come across the work of um, oh, what's the guy's name? Uh, he's written a number of books called Minding the Gap. Um, so. he, basically, he's he's looked at what happens in societies where you've got big gaps between the rich and the poor. Mm. The bigger the gap in inequality between those who've got everything and those who've got nothing on the huge hierarchy in between. In other words, social inequality is stretched. It's biggest in the States. It's pretty big in this country. It's lower in Sweden, one or two of the Scandinavian countries, much tighter. The rich aren't quite so rich necessarily and the poor aren't so poor. The social inequality tends to be greater. Social equality is greater. Social inequality is lower. So the bigger the social inequality gap, the more early pregnancies, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, prison populations, crime. You can name all the social indicators that suggest things are not good, and they're the highest in the States. Pretty high in this country, getting worse, although we're led to believe it's not the case. So the more you invest in the state supporting everyone across the piece, from the, from the vulnerable to the better off, so that everyone's, as it were, paying their way, contributing to the common pot, so that basically that there is more equality, then the rates of all these things begin to diminish, which is why I'm so cross about things like sure start stopping, um, you know, the loss of support for health visitors, um, teacher pupil ratios, um, all these kind of things, in state schools, that is. Um, all these kind of things generally predict problems down the line, increase problems down the line, as people do more desperate things in societies where they get pregnant, they take drugs, they drink, they steal, mm-hmm. um, they get violent, they become antisocial, you name it. Yeah. I'm trying to think of his name. I've probably got the books on my shelf if I look up, but I can't quite spot it at the moment. You know, I, I've uh, heard of it. I've heard of the, the Minding the Gap. Um, mind that, is it done another one as well? Minding the Gap. Um, so just bear with me a minute, Piers, while I just, just scan my bookshelf to see how it pops out. Well, it's interesting. As you look for the book, it brings the story. There was a, a newspaper article recently saying that uh, there's a lot of shoplifting going on at the moment yeah so yeah the struggle that's a good example yeah with um you know the cost of living crisis but the interesting thing is do you know what the number one thing which is shoplifted is food cowpole 
Calpol. Of course. Calpol. Yeah, yeah. Course. Which, uh, for those who yeah. aren't in the UK, yeah. Calpol is a um, a med a kind of a, a liquid um, paracetamol for children, really, isn't it? For children, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's the number well, one shoplifted thing in this. Well, that doesn't that say everything? Sure. Yeah. So I'm just I'm just on my phone to see whether I can quickly discover where this book is. Mm -hmm. And then you, you carry on thinking while I just... Yeah, yeah, it. so yeah, that's fine. I mean, another thing, you know, a quote from your, your book, you said, our evidence supports the hypothesis that the most severe psychological conflicts arise from neglect. And I think there was another thing that I was reading this morning, something to do with, um, I think, similar things... Yeah, over recent years, it has been increasingly recognised that child neglect has a more severe and adverse impact on children's development than abuse, which you mentioned in the beginning. So there's a couple of those quotes in the book. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I found it very interesting. I mean, fascinating to speak to you today and i think yeah that thing of the difference between the gap because we're taught in the uk and possibly the world that the richer the rich get it filters down but that's not the case it's actually the rich what filters down from the top as i spoke to nick duffel last year he says it's actually beliefs and behaviors that filter down you know yeah stiff up actually that. that's that that's that's uh, yeah that's I like that, yeah. yeah. That would make sense. Yeah. And of course, the, 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 as we said before, and we are being very political at the moment, mm -hmm. there's the top set, the, the agenda, the ideology. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, untamed liberal capitalism maybe has a lot to answer for. Uh, and to mimic that particular political climate generally leads to big winners and lots of losers. Um, and then all the problems we've just been identifying. Yeah, yeah. Take that social inequality gap and reduce it, and you end up with generally a happier society. The happy index tends to go up mm -hmm. uh, for more people. Um, yeah. So <laughs> bring on the revolution. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe not. Maybe it's, not. It's definitely it, things are definitely changing. I'm definitely seeing that, that um, people are waking up more and more to what's going on. There's certainly more around the idea of trauma. Mm. And I, I was just fascinated that I, I saw very little in a lot of the psychological books about neglect. So that's why I really wanted to speak to you because it was like, for me, yeah, it's it's such a key thing. Yeah. and 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 it kind of, Obviously, reading so much of your book, it was like, oh my god, that just sounds like boarding school. So, so did you manage to find the book? Then I'm just, uh, you know, I think it might be Richard Wilkinson, but I'll just just double check that. Richard Wilkinson. He's written several books with a colleague. What I can do is I'll put it into the description. I'll find it on Amazon, and then I'll put it into the description so people can, um, can can access that. Um, but yeah yeah i mean the other thing i was wanting to talk a little bit about was emotional neglect if you'd like to to share a little bit about yeah, that just, so, we... so it's richard wilkinson richard wilkinson um, and his colleague kate pickett okay pickett and kate's done a book on her own called the spirit level why equality is better for everyone and then Richard Wilson has written several books himself. Um, and I think one was called Minding the Gap, something like that. Okay. But essentially, it's about how, when there's less aggression and competition, more social equality, people tend to be pleasanter, more benign, and happier. They may not be richer, but they're happier. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. 
Thank you. All right, sorry, I forgot where we were going next. No, no. I mean, we've been talking about an hour now, so it's just checking. We've got. So should we have a kind of a general review and wrap up? Yeah, yeah, please. So I love in your book you have a conclusion. So in each of the chapters. So yeah, I'd love you to conclude and, and wrap up. Oh, <laughs> right. He says. Um <laughs> Well, again, just thanks for the invitation, because uh, I've not really thought about these matters in any detail for quite a while. So if it's wandered a little bit all over the shop, sorry about that. But I think as we're talking and my memory is beginning to go here and, as it were, recall lots of things I've talked about and lectured in the past, then I think what we're essentially saying is that if development of a vulnerable human infant is to be ideal, developmentally optimal, as the professionals say, then the child ideally, optimally, needs to be in a relationship with someone who basically has, they don't have to be clever, they don't have to be intelligent necessarily, they just have to be emotionally intelligent, empathic, understand that there's a link between thoughts, feelings and behaviour and to be interested in that, and to engage with the child at that level. So parents and caregivers, it could be teachers, it could be nursery school teachers, but obviously most powerfully parents and grandparents and people like that. People who can begin to take an interest in the developing young mind. And it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be very heavy duty, on the contrary, it tends to happen in play and exploration, you know, children play, they fall over, they hurt themselves, they run to mommy or granny or whoever. They'll respond, deal with it physically at all levels. Oh, you've hurt your knee. It must be very painful. Oh, dear. Oh, there's a tear in your eye. Let me wipe it away. Um, what should we do about it? Should we get a plaster, do you think? Um, otherwise, you're going to be very upset. It's that constant. It's the integration of body sensation, behaviour thought and feelings and it's, it's not rocket science good people empathic people do it all the time at this kind of everyday level as the child is getting information then of course it builds up their own understanding of themselves but other people understanding them and as i understand me i begin to understand you now uh, that's the pathway to not only secure attachments but also to healthy human psychological development so that's the ideal and most kids will get a version of that as you said at the very beginning that's good enough none of us are perfect sometimes we'll forget to respond empathically to that grazed knee but on in principle a child knows you're there for me and you love me and you care about me um and that will go through the lifespan but as we get older maybe not having the best experiences then as i said with mary main's idea of earned security there may be people on the bit on the way who can act in that role could be a teacher could be a friend it could be an auntie could be granny or the granddad um, and as you get older it could be partners if you feel that you can't access it then it could be formal psychotherapy or some kind of counseling uh, or just simply good work colleagues in friendship groups. Um, so these things can happen at any stage of the lifespan. But the more of a, an aggressive, I don't know, winner-takes-all mentality in society, then, of course, the less of this there is about. If you take away these support networks, like Sure Start and play groups and good health visiting services, home care services, and of course, you're left more and more on your own. So I think my argument is, at every level, individual and state, there needs to be a, a rethink about what's important in life for everyone, not just a few. What's important in life? What a great way to, to end, to, to think of that um, individual and state. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's been great. I've I've really enjoyed this conversation and I probably could talk for another few hours. I have made lots of notes. Oh, I, right. <laughs> I think I could go 
into <laughs> lots of directions with it. Um, but thank you so much for your time. Really recommend people to to read the, your books. Empathy, child who's um, abuse and neglect is brilliant. I found that chapter where you talk about institutions really links into for me to boarding mm. school. Um, you know, and this is for for therapists or counselors, but also if you've been so thank you so much for for your work and you know yeah if i can support you moving forward obviously you're going in a different direction yes yes books, but please do <laughs> well as i said before Pierce, thank you for letting me re-engage with something i've not really been thinking about in detail for a while but who knows i could be revived and onwards and upwards <laughs> well, i think so it's, it's needed at the moment i just think this is a you know, I was looking through four or five of the top psychological bestsellers, Bessel van der Kolk, Judith Herman, yeah. others. No one talks about neglect, not certainly in the, the index. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, this is key. We're seeing this in society at the moment. So therefore, yeah. what is it within the leaders or what is it within society as a whole that's being neglected that this is oh, showing? Yeah, so yeah. I think it's a, a great thing. Well, thank you and, and, and good luck and what a brilliant idea through these podcasts. Um, Thank you. Credit. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.